An abortionist tries very hard to convince herself that she's not killing human beings. So she just calls them zombies and human embryos. And the Democratic Party once again filibusters a bill to protect infants who survive abortions from being killed. Listen, fetus or infant, pro-choicers know that these babies are human, but they don't care. And the why will make you sick. I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. <laughs> Welcome back to the show, guys. Thank you for tuning in today. Listen, if you haven't given the show a rating and review yet, please go ahead and do that for us. It's really helping us reach more people. Just go to wherever you listen, leave us a five stars, leave us a review, let us know what you think. That moves us up the ratings on wherever people listen to podcasts and the show uh, shows up when they're listening to other related content. And we as conservatives, pro-life individuals, people of faith need to saturate these digital markets with ideas that reflect the founding principles of this country, natural rights, and the recognition of their source because the other side is saturating these markets with their ideas to reach the people of the next generation, the posterity of America, who will take the reins of this republic to determine whether we continue to be a country that denies the first and most important of all natural rights, life, to an entire class of human beings simply because they're located six inches away in their mother's womb. So go ahead and do that for us. That really helps us. So listen, pro-choicers pretty much all know that the unborn is human, but they don't care. They don't care. And the why is quite sickening. And so we're going to get into that today. There's this abortionist by the name of Jen Gunter. <clears throat> you may have heard of her before. She's quite popular for being a bit of an infanticidal maniac and uh, abortionist troll on Twitter, has quite a big following. She's sort of this, this blue checkmark baby killer on Twitter. And she recently won the Planned Parenthood Lifetime Achievement Award. This was just last month in January of 2021, which <laughs> I like to say in future generations will be known as the homicide trophy <laughs> for literally being responsible for slaughtering innocent human beings that you do so under the mantle of reproductive health care. So here's what abortionist Jen Gunter uh, tweeted out after she received this Lifetime Achievement Award just last month. She said, an embryo isn't a human. It's a human embryo. And don't effing tell me what I know as a doctor. Now, she began getting all of these responses from doctors, from pro-life individuals, from just common sense people on Twitter for her uh, ageist language in how she describes the unborn. But obviously, obviously, this is a bunch of gobbledygook, right? I mean, this makes literally no sense. Saying that an embryo isn't a human, it's a human embryo, is like saying a toddler isn't a human um, it's a human toddler. <laughs> or a Negro isn't a human, it's a human Negro, as many racists argued. Or a Jew isn't a human, it's a human Jew. <laughs> the reason why this is just stupid, ridiculous, bigoted language is because the class of human beings that you're referring to are human beings. You don't have to qualify it with human. A toddler is by definition a human being. A Jew doesn't refer to an animal who holds religious beliefs. That refers to a human being. So you don't have to say a human Jew. But obviously this is the type of language that Jen Gunter has to use because she's trying to create a class of human persons and a class of human non-persons or a class of biological humans and a class of full human beings like you and I, those who are uh, entitled with a born privilege, I guess you could say. So after being called out by pro-lifers and doctors around the world, Jen Gunter replies to a pro-lifer who called her out. And here, here's what uh, she tweeted back in response to this pro-lifer. She said, it's Dr. Gunter to you. <laughs> I mean, by, by the way, anyone who insists on being called doctor or professor or sir is kind of just a douche anyways with a huge inferiority complex. Um, but I mean, that's to be expected from someone whose career is made off of dismembering babies. She says, we're discussing a subject of my expertise. Oh boy, here we go. The unborn are zombies. That's the, that's the hashtag science. That's the expert opinion. That doesn't apply here. 
use medical terms or at least grown-up words. An embryo is a human embryo, it's not a human. Again, that's like saying a toddler is a human toddler, it's not a human. This is gobbledygook, it makes no sense whatsoever. But you see, dehumanizing portrayals and caricatures of those that you're dehumanizing or victimizing are an all too common strategy used by the practitioners of genocide to justify the mistreatment and murder of those that they want to eliminate, right? And if you're a student of history, you'll know this fairly well. Cartoons routinely depicted Jews during the Nazi regime as dogs, pigs, rats, and other vermin. And Nazis used dehumanizing words, like Jen is using here when she calls the unborn a zombie, they use dehumanizing words like parasites and bacillus, which means bacteria. <laughs> Literally, calling human image bearers of God bacteria to describe those that they exterminated. And East Europeans were considered by Nazis to be untermensch. Now, untermensch means literally subhuman, less than, not a full human. Almost like Jen saying, the unborn is not a human being, it's a human embryo. It's a subhuman, it's a different class of humans. It's not like us as born people, whose mothers didn't rip off our arms in the womb, and whose mothers weren't active, uh, exercising their right to choose. By the way, Untermensch was the title of Heinrich Himmler's propaganda book that propagated the society with a, with a bigoted, anti-Jewish view of the human person. And so for unborn babies, Jen Gunter res reserves the title zombies. And of course, unborn and aborted children in the abortion debate are often labeled dehumanizing terms, such as, have you heard of POC, products of conception? <laughs> yeah, we're all products of conception. That's where we came from. We were conceived in a womb, and the only difference is a degree of difference. I am more developed than a toddler. A toddler is more developed than an infant, and an infant is more developed than a fetus, but they're all human beings who just find themselves at a different tick mark on that continuum of human development. Of course, unborn children are labeled blobs of tissue or insensate tissue or pregnancy tissue, or they're literally called the pregnancy. And abortion rights activists often compare unborn children to animal fetuses. And so they'll put the fetus at 16, 18 weeks next to a elephant fetus or something and say, look, they look kind of similar, right? They're just, uh, they're just sort of potential life. And other abortionists have referred to the unborn child in very dehumanizing ways as well. So this abortionist, Jen Gunter, refers to the unborn child as zombies. Well, abortionist Warren Hearn, who wrote the leading medical textbook teaching, quote unquote, doctors how to perform abortions, it's called abortion practice, he analogized the unborn to parasites and says in his book on how to perform abortions, the relationship between the mother and the baby can be best understood as one of host and parasite. <laughs> now, obviously, this is anti-scientific <clears throat> bigotry because a parasite is by definition a different species from uh, it, the person that it's from its host. The parasite is by definition not the same species as the host. So, but this is coming from the party of science, right? This is coming from quote unquote doctors um, or abortionists masquerading as doctors. So this, twiddle, this Twitter battle continued for a while. The whole thing kind of went viral. And so uh, Jen Gunter here responds in another tweet. And she says, a human fetus is a human fetus. What don't you understand? It's not a horse fetus or a cow fetus, or a pig fetus, it is a human fetus. It's not a human, it's a human fetus. Human fetus, human fetus. <laughs> Just repeating herself but again and again and again. So what is Jen Gunter saying here? Obviously, this is not science. Obviously, this is a woman trying very hard to convince herself that she's not murdering innocent human beings. But what are the assumptions wrapped up in her statements? In other words, what is her worldview? What does she believe? And we're going to get into a couple things that I think her statements believes in just one second. But first, I want to hear from you, all right? We're going to be uh, adding more episodes to this podcast very soon. And so we want to begin taking your questions as well. We'll be moving to two episodes a week here shortly on Unaborted with Seth Gruber. So stay tuned for that. But there's always more to get to. And so if you have questions for me or things that you'd like me to cover in this show that I haven't covered yet, go ahead and shoot me an email at unaborted at sethgruber.com. That's unaborted at sethgruber.com if you have any questions. And uh, if they're good ones, we'll go ahead and include them in, in future episodes and we'll cover those uh, questions from the listeners as well. So thanks so much. We're going to get uh, back to a whole lot more in just one second. <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome back to the show. Thanks for staying tuned in with us. So we've been talking about this abortionist, Jen Gunter, and her anti-scientific bigotry and what her statements kind of reveal about her view of the person and her view of human equality and um, her view of, of what it means to have value. And I think her statements re reveal a couple different things that I want to get into because, you know, it's been said that assumed ideas are the most dangerous ideas or um, assumed premises are the most dangerous premises because you're not even aware that you've adopted those ideas, but you're functioning off of those ideas, right? It was just assumed during the Holocaust that Jews were less than, were not full persons. Uh, no one really offered a, subst a substantive argument as to why. It was just merely assumed. And so what, what are some of the assumptions that Jen Gunter is making in her, her ageist, bigoted, anti-scientific tweets? Well, I think the first assumption is a scientific assumption, right? She's saying that it's a human fetus because it's biologically human. And you'll hear this language a lot from those that you've talked to on the issue of abortion, right? I I'm sure you've had pro-choicers tell you, okay, the unborn is biologically human because it has human DNA, because it has human parents whose DNA was required to create that new human being. Okay, so the unborn is biologically human, but it's not a whole human being. It's not fully human. It's not human in the same way that you and I are. You've probably heard this type of language before. So what she means is that the fetus has human DNA, but it's not a human. She, she reserves that term, human, to those who are born, of course, and that's, of course, the, the irony of born privilege and being pro-choice is that everyone who's for abortion has already been born. But this is obviously anti-scientific nonsense, and it makes me wonder when exactly Jen Gunter believes a human being begins. When do we become human, if not the moment of conception, which is something she, of course, um, does not believe. So according to her, that's entirely up to the parents. And, and this is what gets really disgusting and disturbing about pro-choice ideology. Gunter actually writes in her blog in 2019 that her own son was born prematurely and only survived a, like a couple hours or minutes. And she opted to record him as born alive in the medical records after her son who was born prematurely died to record him as born alive. But she writes in her blog that she later regretted that, saying that he lived after birth for three minutes and was then charged uh, an exorbitant hospital bill because it wasn't just delivering a dead baby. This was an infant that was at least attempted to be cared for for a few minutes but was not able to survive. And in her blog post, here's what she has to say about her own son who was born prematurely and died. She says, here was the takeaway. She says, quote, a live birth does not mean a life is possible. There is a huge difference. And the recording of a live birth can be fluid based on parental wishes. All right, anytime you hear that word fluid from the left, uh, you sh your warning light should be going off, right? This is how they talk about truth. This is how they talk about human value. This is how they talk about whether there's such a thing as objective truth. It's all fluid. It changes. It moves. And we just have to roll with the punches. And so she says that a, a child who sur either survives a botched abortion or is born prematurely and is breathing and is there and is not dead is not really a life if the parents don't define that human being as a life. It's fluid and it's based on the parental wishes. So if you just wish your child out of existence and you wish your child to not be defined as a full human being, then they're not. And of course, this fits within pro-abortion ideology, right? Because how do they define human value? Wantedness, right? If I don't want to be pregnant, if it's an unwanted pregnancy, then the child has no value. And we saw this with John Legend and Chrissy Teigen. Do you remember this? I covered this in a blog post towards the end of 2020, and I believe we talked about it on the show as well, but Chrissy Teigen has a miscarriage, says that they already named their son, has got tens of millions of likes on Instagram, I think, talking about the tragedy of losing their son, who they named, but Chrissy Teigen and John Legend have given hundreds of thousands of dollars to Planned Parenthood, and, and John Legend led the boycott in 2019 against Georgia, who is trying to pass pro-life legislation trying to get his fellow Hollywood colleagues to not film, produce, or create in the state of Georgia so that Georgia doesn't benefit from the taxes of that production because we need to boycott states that believe all humans are persons and unborn children should be protected from legalized human dismemberment. So you got John Legend and Chrissy Teigen, radical pro-abortion activists, advocates, and donors, but who are now telling us we need to mourn with them over the, the loss of their 
their unborn child, why? Because he was wanted. Because the parents wanted the child, therefore the child has value. Now, it sort of begs the question, if Chrissy Teigen wanted to abort their son, but John Legend didn't, would John Legend respect his wife's wishes because she didn't want the child? Or would he insist that that child had value regardless of whether Chrissy Teigen wanted the child or not because John Legend wanted the child and it was a human being? So is your status as an image bearer of God and your inherent dignity purely dependent on the psychological state of your parents' minds, whether they think they want you or not? Clearly not. So this is the irony of choice. Of course, Gunter would have wanted her son, would have not wanted her son to be born prematurely and then died. Uh, but she's going to convince herself that parents can define their own children out of existence. Why? In order to justify her career. Because she murders innocent human beings in the womb for a living and makes a lot of money doing so. And acknowledging that these children have value irrespective of whether their parents want them or not means that she has to wake up in the, and look at herself in the mirror each morning and say, I'm a homicidal maniac. So Gunter is adopting the age-old strategy of pro-abortion bigotry, which is, and this is important, okay, is to confuse philosophical claims with scientific ones. And you need to be aware of this in the abortion debate. The left does this sort of writ large within their politics anyways, right? They claim that there's sort of a science to politics, that there's a science of the universe, right? Now, Obama used to say, you know, the, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice, meaning that we're always perfecting human nature. There's a science to the universe, and if we can just get the formula right, if we can just tinker with human nature and tinker with politics, we can perfect human nature. We can perfect politics. So there, there's sort of this progressive train that's going along. We can't stop the progressive train. You either jump on it or be run over by it, but we can't stop it because it's progressing towards perfection. This is the belief in the science of the universe, the science of politics. And so the left will do this all the time. They'll describe their anti-scientific nonsense as just science or their philosophical views of the person as science, because no one wants to be anti-science, right? Doesn't science have to deal with objective things that we can actually know through observation? Well, if that's true, and you're against science, then you're against progress, see? That's the view of the left. So they're going to label their very dangerous philosophical views of the human person as science. So then when you say, I disagree with you, they say, well, you're against science, what's wrong with you? Okay, so you need to be aware of this. And this happens in the abortion debate as well. They confuse or intentionally conflate philosophical claims with scientific ones. Or worse yet, they insist that their philosophical view of the person is actually just science. And you can see this in Jen Gunter's language, can't you, this abortionist. She starts talking about the unborn as a, as a human embryo, but not a human. Well, what does that even mean? An embryo is just a term to describe a human being at an early stage in their physical development. So science can't tell us whether human beings have dignity or natural rights. Science just tells us which kinds of beings we are, right? Are we cows? Are we aliens? Are we dogs? No, we're human beings. We're homo sapiens. We are a certain type of species, and science tells us that. But that humanity is something that Gunter denies to the victims of her career, probably so she can sleep at night. We have to turn to philosophy to answer questions of dignity, value, and natural rights. But what does the science say about the when humans become humans. Remember, her first assumption here is a scientific assumption that there are somehow human beings and then human embryos and that they're different. <laughs> that there's two different class of humans. Partial humans who are becoming humans, like embryos, and full humans. Well, this is not scientific. So what does the science say about when humans become humans, okay? I'm just gonna run through a bunch of uh, real science for you, okay? So you know how to uh, debunk this sort of um, ridiculous conflation of philosophical principles um, with the science label that they swap onto their bigotry. Um, in the Developing Human, Clinically Oriented Embryology by Keith L. Moore, it's one of the most widely used embryology textbooks on university campuses, here's what he writes. Human development begins at fertilization. The process during which a male gamete or sperm unites with a female gamete or oocyte to form a single cell called a zygote. This highly specialized titipotent cell marked the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. <laughs> okay, that's embryology for you, saying that actually us as unique individuals, our genesis was from the zygote stage. Our genesis was from the moment of conception. The same embryology textbook continues later and says, a zygote is the beginning of a new human being. Yes, 
Jen Gunter, a new human being, not a human embryo, not a partial human. And we've known this since the, for decades. In 1975, in a textbook called Pathology of the Fetus and the Infant, it says every time a sperm cell and ovum unite, a new being is created, which is alive and will continue to live unless its death is brought about by some specific condition. In Langman's Medical Embryology textbook from 2006, we read that development begins with fertilization, the process during which the male gamete, the sperm, and the female gamete, the oocyte, unite to give rise to a zygote. Peter Singer, that radical infanticidal maniac who teaches philosophy at uh, Princeton, I believe, and is the author of the book Practical Ethics from 1993, uh, Peter Singer publicly defends infanticide, by the way. So he believes that children up to one years old can be, uh, it, it's morally permissible to kill them because they don't meet the functions or standards that he says human beings must meet to be persons, whatever that means. He writes in his book, Practical Ethics, whether a being is a member of a given species is something that can be determined scientifically by an examination of the nature of the chromosomes in the cells of living organisms. In this sense, there is no doubt that from the first moments of its, of its existence, an embryo conceived from human sperm and eggs is a human being, okay? This is coming from probably one of the most morally deficient, bankrupt individuals in the entire country who says, yeah, of course the unborn is a human being, fully and wholly. David Boonin, a philosopher and pro-abortion advocate and the author of the book A Defense of Abortion from 2003 writes, a human fetus, after all, is simply a human being at a very early stage in his or her development. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and then in 1981, the United States uh, Senate Judiciary Subcommittee received some testimonies from a collection of medical experts to answer this question, when does human life begin? And I'll cite to you just uh, maybe two or three here that um, testified to answer this question. Dr. Jeremy Le Guin, a professor of genetics at the University of Descartes, said, after fertilization has taken place, a new human being has come into being. And he actually goes on to say, it's actually not even a matter of taste or opinion, meaning if you disagree with me, you know, too bad, <laughs> you're wrong. He says, it is plain experimental evidence. Each individual has a very neat beginning at conception. Dr. Watson A. Bowles from the University of Colorado Medical School also testified in 1981 saying, the beginning of a single human life is from a biological point of view, a simple and straightforward matter. The beginning is conception. And lastly, Dr. Jaime Gordon, a professor of medical genetics and physician at the prestigious Mayo Clinic writes, I think we can now also say that the question of the beginning of life, when life begins, is no longer a question for theological or philosophical dispute. It is an established scientific fact. Theologians and philosophers may go on to debate the meaning of life or the purpose of life, but it is an established fact that all life, including human life, begins at the moment of conception. Okay, so the, there's sort of a collection of medical and scientific evidence answering this question, when does human life begin? It begins at the moment of conception. There is no such thing as a human non-person. There's no such thing as a partial human <laughs> or a becoming human. You are fully and wholly human from the moment of conception. So that sort of debunks her first sort of scientific assumption that's very common in the abortion debate, which is to acknowledge that the unborn is somehow human, like it has human DNA, but it's not a whole human. Um, that is a fantasy. You can tuck that away with the tooth fairy. The second assumption that she makes here is sort of a philosophical assumption, okay? So who is a human being that is entitled to human rights, according to Dr. Jen Gunter, is, is based on our functions and capacities, okay? So now we're moving away from the question of sort of your status as a species. We're obviously human. Now we're moving into the realm of philosophy. Do we have human rights? Where do these human rights come from? Do we all share them equally? Who gets to decide? These are questions that only philosophy can answer. And so for Gunter, we know that Jen Gunter and other people in the abortion industry believe that human beings only have value based off of their functions and capacities. The reason we know this is because Jen Gunter would never claim that a three-year-old toddler is not a human being and can therefore be killed by his parents. Because a three-year-old meets Gunter's standard for human beings. But her view of humans and human rights is not science. It's a philosophical view and it's a very old and dangerous view 
It goes by the name of functionalism, okay? Functionalism says that having a particular nature doesn't bestow value. So just because you're part of the species Homo sapiens, just because you're a human being with a human nature, that's actually not where value comes from. So that doesn't mean that you have an inalienable right to life, according to this abortionist and the abortion rights movement. Rather, having an immediately exercisable capacity for self-awareness or conscience, consciousness is what gives you human rights, right? Functions, capacities. The worldview of functionalism says that your rights come from how you perform, how you can live. Do you have awareness? Can you interact with your environment? Are you aware of your own existence? Do you have memories? Do you have meaningful relationships? Are you conscious? These are human functions. So they confuse human functions with human value. But the position of the pro-life movement is that our value does not come from our functions or capacities, it comes from our human nature, which began at the moment of conception. So Jen Gunter believes that the unborn is not a bearer of rights because the unborn does not function like you and I do. And typically the abortion supporter, or abortionist in this case, points to the unborn's lack of self-awareness or consciousness to argue that they don't have rights, right? And you probably experienced this in conversations on abortion, haven't you, right? They say, well, the unborn doesn't know they're being killed, right? They can't feel pain. They're not aware of their own existence. They're not self-aware. They're not conscious. They're never going to know that they were aborted. They don't have any desires that they're consciously aware of, and so therefore they don't have a right to life, right? These are the type of functions that you'll hear pro-abortion advocates appeal to and assume that the possession of those capacities or functions is what gives one a right to life. But there's a few problems with this. There's, there's, there's a few problems with saying that human rights are based on functions, such as self-awareness, such as consciousness. The first is, is the assumption that those capacities are value-giving in the first place, right? Why is it, Jen Gunter, abortion rights movement, why is the immediate capacity for self-awareness value-giving in the first place? Instead of arguing why this function is decisive or grants value, pro-aborts like Jen Gunter will simply assume and assert that it matters. But they won't offer a defense as to why the possession of self-awareness, why the possession of consciousness grants one rights. They just assume it. The most dangerous ideas in a society are not the ones being argued, but the ones that are assumed, to quote C.S. Lewis. <laughs> and... So why is that function value giving in the first place? And why that function over another, right? Gunter might say that self-awareness and the ability to interact with your environment makes you fully human with all the rights therein. But what if someone else says that actually, uh, it's actually skin color and gender that grants one full humanity and rights. Oh wait, uh, we've already seen how that goes. <laughs> we've already gone down that road, right? Do you see? Now did, did racists ever offer a substantive argument as to why melanin had anything to do with human rights? No, they just assumed it, didn't they? Did sexists who denied women the equal right to vote and all of the other equal rights, um, did they ever offer a substantive argument as to why being female uh, didn't entitle you to the same rights as men? No, they just assumed it. Similarly, pro-aborts don't offer a substantive argument as to why the possession of consciousness or self-awareness is value-giving in the first place for the unborn. They just assumed it. And assumed premises, especially when undetected, can destroy a nation. So that's the first problem with uh, Gunter's philosophical assumptions, the assumptions that your functions and capacities are what ground your rights and not your human nature, which begins at the moment of conception. The second problem is that this idea of functionalism, right, which again grounds rights in our functions, not our nature. Functionalism proves too much meaning it ends up justifying other type of heinous behaviors and the killing of other innocent human beings that the pro-abort would probably, probably not like to see killed. So meaning if you adopt Gunter's functionalism or performance view of personhood and human rights, then many born people are necessarily disqualified too from the right to life. Because if self-awareness is a required function that you must possess before you're a human being with rights, then the newborn and the severe Alzheimer patient is not self-aware and can therefore be killed as well. We know that newborns, infants, are not self-aware. They're not aware of their own existence as a unique individual. I've watched my grandparents go through severe Alzheimer's and they're not self-aware either. 
So if you're gonna ground rights in things like consciousness and self-awareness, it's not only the unborn who could be justifiably killed, it would be certain classes of born individuals as well. By the way, this is exactly what Peter Singer believes and defends. In his book, Practical Ethics, Peter Singer states that if self-awareness determines value and newborns and fetuses lack it, then both are disqualified from the community of persons. He makes the point in his book that you can't draw an arbitrary line at birth and spare the newborn while grounding rights in things that would disqualify the newborn. So to Peter Singer's credit, at least he's intellectually consistent, despite the fact that he's deeply, deeply morally bankrupt. So that's the second problem with functionalism is that it proves too much and it ends up justifying the killing of people outside the womb as well. And if you'll recall, this is the type of argumentation that Abraham Lincoln utilized in attacking racist ideologies, in attacking the racist worldview that made slavery possible in the first place. He responded to racists by saying, you say A is white and B is black. It is color then, the lighter having the right to enslave the darker. Um, take care, by this rule, you were to be a slave to the first man you meet with a skin fairer than your own. <laughs> All right? Lincoln, that, that OG uh, conservative troll, if you will, taking the racist arguments of plantation owners, turning them on their head and saying, that worldview could be used to enslave you. Because if skin color is decisive in human rights and personhood, then I guess albinos are the most valuable of all because they have the most pale skin and could therefore enslave normal skinned white people who aren't as pale. Ridiculous, right? Do you see? Lincoln was resorting to the same type of argumentation as pro-life individuals do. It's the same worldview. It's a worldview that grounds rights in things we don't have in common rather than a human nature. The third problem with functionalism, which is the philosophical assumption of abortionists, of this woman, Jen Gunter, and of the abortion rights movement writ large, this functionalism also destroys human equality. Listen, if human beings only have value because of some acquired property, like skin color, consciousness, or self-awareness rather than a human nature, then it follows that since acquired properties come in varying degrees, basic human rights come in varying degrees, right? If you ground rights in skin color, but then you line you know, your city up and you have them all put their arms out, you'll find a varying degree of skin color. Skin color comes in varying degrees. But if you ground rights in things that come in varying degrees, then it follows that rights come in varying degrees. Human rights and personhood come in varying degrees. But do we really want to say that those with more self-awareness are more human and more valuable than those with less? Are you as self-aware when you're sleeping as when you're awake? Are you as self-aware when you're unconscious as when you're awake? Of course not. So when you adopt the premises of functionalism, you actually destroy your ability to defend the idea of human equality, which is the very thing that the left appeals to when they argue for abortion rights, right? What language do they use to justify abortion? Women's equality, right? The way that women, the only way that women can be equal to men is through abortion. Right, because it's not fair that men don't have to be as responsible for children and they're not hindered in their career goals by pregnancy, but women are. So for women to be truly equal to men, they need to have the right to abort and murder their own unborn child. The left appeals to the idea of equality to justify their pro-choice position, but the very equality that they're looking for, they will not find in the premises of functionalism because functionalism destroys human equality by grounding the very rights they seek to enshrine in things we don't have in common. So now let's return to Jen Gunter. Does this self-described doctor and abortionist actually believe, do you think that she actually believes that nine month, nine month unborn children are not human beings? Of course not. Of course she believes that those are human beings right before they move six inches through the birth canal. But denying the self-evident truth is required for Gunter to go to sleep at night and live with herself. This is what abortionists have to do. They have to stick their head fully in the sand and deny the existence of an external reality 
as George Orwell's characters did, in order to live with themselves. And Romans 1 tells us that this is exactly what will happen, doesn't it? They, 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 Romans tells us that these are the people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. I have a thought for you. If God's invisible qualities can be clearly seen by all, although he himself cannot be seen, how much more clear should the truth about human life be to everyone since we can see our fellow human beings? We don't see God, at least not yet, but according to Romans, his truths are clearly apparent and self-evident despite the fact that we cannot see him, the source of all truth. How much more so should the self-evident truth of human life be to all of us who can see our fellow human beings, and for Jen Gunter, see the limbs that she dismembers when she goes to work. And the fellow human beings that Jen Gunter murders are, to her, not human. But she is the one arranging their human body parts on the table after she dismembers them. She knows that these are human beings, but as Romans 1 says, she will suppress that truth in order to live with herself and deny reality because the reality, simply put, is too heinous for the American public to handle. If abortion is such a great idea, why does a simple picture of it always piss everyone off? Because abortion imagery shows the heinous act of what you defend, which is the murder of innocent human beings. So we're going to get to just one more example of this in just one second. This example of pro-choicers knowing that the unborn is human, but not caring at all. And we're going to get to that why in just a second. But first, if you like this show and want to hear more great content and commentary from the front lines of the abortion wars, then head on over to patreon.com forward slash unaborted. That's patreon.com forward slash unaborted. And become a patron of the show. Help us reach more people. Listen, we've got nine different tiers on there for you. Fun names like Sassy Since Conception, Pro-Life Apologist, Life Defender, The Bane of Choice, and, Ab and, Ab and Abolitionist. And you'll just have fun perks and access to me as a thank you for supporting the show. But this is how we're able to reach more people, create more content to change minds, change hearts, and save lives, and begin improving the production quality of the show, doing more episodes a week, and then creating interactive content that we want to do on university campuses and on the sidewalk where we put these ideas that you listen to me articulate in a conversational format with people who have never thought deeply about these ideas. So to support the show, go to patreon.com forward slash unaborted. We really appreciate it. And we'll be right back with a whole lot more. Welcome back to the show. So I think you probably would agree that abortionists know fully well what they're doing, right? If we were to pick one person who knew that the unborn was human but didn't care, it would obviously be abortionists, right? I mean, these people have to arrange the body parts on the table afterwards to make sure that they didn't leave any floating baby pieces in mother's uterus, making her susceptible to sepsis and death. If anyone were to know that these were human beings but not care, it would certainly be abortionists. But maybe you're thinking, but maybe mainstream Democrats don't believe that, you know? Maybe Democratic politicians are just kind of towing the party line in order to get votes, uh, but maybe they've really sort of bought the lie that these are not human beings, uh, particularly in the earlier trimesters, and they're just kind of going along to get along. Well, I kind of want to challenge that idea with you, because congressional Democrats have once again killed a bill that would protect infants already born who survive botched abortions. And they have filibustered um, and voted down this bill time and time again. According to Live Action News on February 4th, on Thursday, January 28th, less than a week after the 48th anniversary of Roe v.ersus Wade, Republican Senator Ben Sass from Nebraska reintroduced his Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act in the Senate. He first introduced the bill in 2015 and then again in 2017 and 2019, but it failed to become law each time. Now, the amendment received a bipartisan majority vote of 52 to 48, but failed to meet the 60 vote threshold required to advance. Now, why did it have to meet the 60 vote threshold? Uh, oh yeah, because they filibustered the bill. So you have to get 60 votes or more. The only Democrats, by the way, in the Senate to vote in support of the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act was Joe Manchin, Bob Casey, 
and Doug Jones. And some conservative pundits actually believe that Joe Manchin might actually switch parties, something to pray for, by the way, because our Senate is split 50-50, leaving the tie-breaking vote to Kamala Harris, the most pro-abortion politician in American history. So if Joe Manchin were to switch parties, that would be a very good thing indeed. But these Bob Casey and Doug Jones are pro-choice, but they just uh, sort of come from more purple districts. And if they uh, didn't vote for an anti-infanticide bill, they probably wouldn't get reelected uh, in their states. And so um, this, this bill is literally an anti-infanticide bill, okay? Let me tell you what this bill would have done. It would not have regulated abortion whatsoever, meaning it would have not prevented or regulated the killing of babies in the womb at all. Only the babies who are outside the womb, who I like to say escaped through the birth canal, right? They survived the abortion attempt on their life and were born alive. This bill would have done a few things. It would have required that babies who survive botched abortions are immediately transferred to a hospital and be given the same level of medical attention and care as any other baby would receive born under similar circumstances at the same gestational age. And the reason why babies who survive botched abortions have to be transferred to a hospital should be self-evident to you. Abortion clinics are not created to preserve life, they're created to end life, and they're literally not equipped to care for babies who are alive and born and survive the procedure that their parents paid to perform on them, which of course is their murder. And lastly, if an abortionist or abortion staff workers don't report the fact that a baby was born alive during a botched abortion, there will be legal consequences. And worse yet, if the abortionist kills that baby or just refrains to care for the baby, steps back and just lets the baby die, he'll be charged with murder. So this should be incredibly bipartisan because you're not talking about abortion, are you? You're not. The only time I think the word abortion appears in the bill is in the name, born alive abortion survivors. You're not talking about preventing the killing of babies in the womb. Okay. Now, there was a Born Alive Infant Protection Act that was um, passed under the Bush administration, but it didn't prescribe penalties for abortionists who failed to save the lives of abortion survivors. So many abortionists have been getting away with killing or refraining to care for babies who, who have survived um, botched abortions. So the question here is, do Senate Democrats really believe that infants already born because they survived an abortion, are not human beings with human rights? Ask yourself, do you really think that Democratic senators think that infants who are already born are not human beings with human rights? No, of course not. They're all grandparents, right? Many of them are parents. Of course they believe that an infant already born should not be allowed to be killed and have their death sanctioned by the United States government. But they will sanction their murder anyways. Why? Why? Why would they look at it? an abortion survivor infant wriggling around on the table and say, we shouldn't pass laws to protect them? Well, Democrats' defense in voting against this bill was twofold. Firstly, they argued something like this. They said, we already have laws against infanticide. And so therefore, this is a Trojan horse bill with a far-right anti-abortion goal, right? They said that this bill was unnecessary because we already had laws against infanticide. But that doesn't acknowledge the fact that many abortionists are getting away with it anyways, killing infants who survive botched abortions or just letting them die, which is killing them. Alexandra DeSanctis at National Review breaks this down for us. She says that there is no existing federal law that requires doctors to provide medical care for infants who survive an abortion procedure. The Born Alive Infants Protection Act of 2002 established that the terms person, human being, child, and individual in federal law include every infant born alive, even after an abortion. But it instituted no penalties for physicians who neglect to care for such infants. And as of 2014, only 26 states mandated care for infants born alive after an attempted abortion. And those state laws can, of course, be changed. So the point is, is that many states don't require that abortionists or physicians care for the lives of children who were born alive during botched abortions. And so they're getting away with allowing these children to die or even actively killing them. And this line from the Democrats said, we already have laws against infanticide, so this anti-infanticide bill is not necessary, is quite hilarious given that I believe Kamala Harris in 2019 was the co-sponsor of a bill that labeled lynching a federal hate crime. Labeling lynching a federal hate crime. Now listen, that's great. <laughs> lynchings are horrible. It's ironic that she sanctions uh, womb lynchings, which would be another word for abortion. But let me ask you a question. Is it illegal to kill black people regardless of how you do it? 
Uh, yeah, it's illegal to kill black people regardless of how you do it. So would it matter that we killed them through lynchings? No, that would still be murder, and that murder uh, would still be prosecuted, wouldn't it? So you wouldn't need to label lynchings a federal hate crime because we already have laws against murder regardless of how you murder someone. But they thought that passing that law was still very important. So it's just complete BS that Democrats are not willing to pass laws um, against certain behaviors that they think we already have laws against. Clearly, the lynching case stands as, a, as an example. The other defense is that they say babies being born alive after botched abortions doesn't happen. They just kind of deny it, right? They say this doesn't happen. This is just a conservative pro-life talking point. Well, that begs the question, then what do you have to lose in voting against the bill? What would you have to lose politically in voting against an anti-infanticide bill if these don't even happen anyways? Just, just vote against infanticide to protect infants born alive during botched abortions just in case there might be some circumstances where it happens. Um, according to the live action news piece, though, state reports from recent years tell a different and more tragic story. Since 2008, and reporting from only five states, over 100 babies were born alive while abortions were committed on them and their mothers. Four of the 27 instances of babies born alive over the years in Florida took place in 2020 just last year. And the Centers for Disease Control has also reported that at least 143 babies known to have survived abortions nationwide between 2003 and 2014. But the CDC added that this number is likely, quote, in underestimation, right? Because we don't have procedures in place to ensure that we know when babies are born alive during botched abortions because abortionists can get away with it by telling the mother that the baby was dead, by snipping their spinal cords, right, as, as uh, abortionists have done, and then throwing them in the dumpster, okay? So how can we know that these are happening or not happening? It's very difficult. So the numbers are probably much higher. But the question becomes this, right? To get back to this idea that pro-choicers know that the unborn is human, they fully know, but they don't care, right? Let's get back to that idea. Why do Senate Democrats ignore the lack of laws requiring states to provide medical care to babies born alive during failed abortions? You see, the answer is this. The left understands the danger of conservatives succeeding in what Robert P. George calls planting moral premises in the law. Now, Robert P. George uh, is a Princeton University professor, natural law thinker, uh, pro-life advocate, brilliant mind. And he talks about this idea of planting moral premises in the law. Here's what he says. He says, planting moral premises in the law whose logic demands in the end full respect for all members of the human family can be a valuable thing to do even where those premises seem modest. Yeah, it seems like a pretty, pretty modest premise, doesn't it? That babies who survive botched abortions and are already born ought not to be killed, and they ought to be given all the same level of medical attention and care as any other baby would be given. That seems like a pretty modest premise. But of course, all but three Senate Democrats voted against that anti-infanticide bill. You see, Senate Democrats are smart enough to realize that if they condemn infanticide, right after the baby is born, right after it escapes the birth canal, it becomes morally untenable to suggest that the mother should still have the right to get an abortion seconds, minutes, hours, or a day before that baby is born. You see, the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act might plant uh, logical premises in the law that would eventually demand we respect the unborn child. In turn, abortion would be decreased and limited. Because if we know that they know that infants who are already born are human beings with human rights, then do we really think that they believe that the child right before mom pushes him out is not a human being with human rights? No, they obviously think that that's a human being. So they're granting that the unborn child is and can be a human being, but they don't care. And they are willing to condone infanticide. They're willing to allow that to operate to prevent those pesky pro-life Republicans from planting moral premises in the law that might lead to the slow but gradual protection of all unborn children, the slow but gradual curtailment of abortion rights, right? <laughs> because if you can get the American public on board with protecting infants who survive botched abortions, it's very easy to then say, uh, third trimester abortions are not permissible because that's obviously the same human being. Then it becomes very easy to continue to push back the right to abortion to earlier and earlier stages until 
it is abolished. However, this lie that not all humans are equally human and not all humans have human rights is extremely, extremely popular, right? For most pro-choicers, if you press them, they will admit that the unborn is human, but they don't believe they're fully human, whatever that means. And this is what's called the power of normalization, right? And Joseph Goebbels understood this, right? The, the Nazi propagandist for Adolf Hitler. He said that if you tell a lie big enough, but you keep repeating it over and over and over and over again, people will eventually come to believe it, right? And you see, um, you see uh, 1984 and George Orwell dealing with this kind of idea, right? That it wasn't enough for us to repeat the two plus two equal five, we actually had to believe it. That was the goal of the big brother state. It's not enough for people to just say that they're pro-choice. You actually have to believe that the unborn is not a full human being. So whether it's abortionists or the party of abortion, these individuals know fully well that unborn babies are human beings. So why don't they care enough to protect these children? Why? Well, I think the reasons will vary, right? I think for abortionists, it's largely psychological. Admitting the reality of what they do means facing the gruesome truth of themselves each morning, that they are a homicidal maniac. For parents who schedule their children's death, I think, I think the reason is largely selfish. They know that these unborn children are human beings. Um, that's why they have a, sh a sense of shame associated with going into an abortion clinic. That's why uh, almost 75% of abortion appointments are canceled if there's Christians standing outside of abortion clinics because the women who are going to the appointment to kill their child don't want to be seen by others going in. But would they care that they were seen by others going in if they were having a polyp or tumor removed? No, of course not. So deep down they know that this is a human being. But they believe that their quality of life matters more than the reality of their child's life. And for example, there was a pro-abortion singer just last month in January. Maybe you saw this story. Her, I guess her name is Halsey. I don't really listen to you know, current day pop, but I guess her, she's name, her name's Halsey and she's a Planned Parenthood donor and singer and she's pregnant. And guess what she called her unborn baby? A quote, mini human. She called it a mini human. And in a tweet uh, talking with her partner or boyfriend or whatever, she says that it's a mini human that she already loves so much then why do you give money to an organization that's responsible for 30% of the murdered unborn children whose deaths you help sanction, right? Because that child was wanted, see? This is the irony of choice. And then for the Democratic Party, it's largely, I think, political and financial, why they're willing to acknowledge that the unborn is human but not care enough to protect them. Because allowing access to abortion to be compromised risks their re-election and risks their massive campaign donations from abortion rights groups. Because if you can regulate abortion in the third trimester, you can regulate it in the second trimester by making the point that it's the same human being. It's just slightly smaller. Shouldn't we protect those children as well? They understand the danger of us planting moral premises in the law that will eventually protect all human life. But whether it's selfish, whether it's financial, whether it's political, it's all an example of bigotry. The ability of American citizens to look at the child in the womb and somehow not see their neighbor, somehow not see their brother and sister, somehow not see their child that they were responsible for creating and a human being with equal rights who ought to be protected. And that's because bigotry is a powerful thing. Bigotry is a hell of a powerful thing. Do you think that Nazis actually thought that they were bigots? Did racists think that they were bigots? No, of course not. They thought that they were on the right side of history. But that's how powerful bigotry is. It blinds you to what would otherwise be obvious truths about human nature. And, the cha and changing the minds of abortionists and the Democratic Party infrastructure is not going to happen anytime soon because that bigotry is so far entrenched. And if you know anything about American political life, you'll know that the Democratic Party is more radical on abortion than they have ever been. And they're only becoming more radical. So yes, we must fight the culture wars, right? To change minds and hearts. But that is not enough because as long as abortion remains legal, the law will continue to teach the country that abortion is a, quote, women's rights issue. For legal abortion to stand and to be justified under the mantle of women's rights, the unborn child necessarily must be dehumanized, right? Because 
50% of unborn children are unborn women who have no women's rights. <laughs> so for abortion to stand as the law of the land and to be justified by politicians and woke pastors as women's rights and reproductive health care, the unborn child necessarily must be dehumanized in the process of that. So as long as people with political power grant that the unborn are human but don't care that they're murdered, in fact, they will campaign to protect the institution of womb lynchings, then we must exercise political power when we have it in order to end abortion and pass laws to protect the preborn. Because as Aristotle said many years ago, statecraft is soulcraft. Yes, Politics is downstream from culture, but sometimes culture is downstream from politics. That's a two-way street, and I'll prove it to you. Do you think Americans were ready for the abolition of slavery? Um, no, I think we fought a war over it that killed hundreds of thousands of people. America was not ready for abolition culturally, right? But we drew a political line in the sand before the country was ready to say that these things are not acceptable in what should be a civilized society because slavery questioned the very premises of the republic itself, namely that all human beings are created equal. Well, that equality was being denied to an entire class of human beings. So the politics came in, drew a line in the sand, and said, this is stopping now. And unfortunately, it took another hundred years, right, before we had full equality before the law for our black brothers and sisters. Remember, the Civil Rights Act didn't happen until nearly a hundred years, I believe 99 years, after the abolition of slavery. So culture and politics are actually a two-way street. We do have to fight at the cultural level, but that is not enough because law functions as a teacher. And we have had generations of people who have been born and raised in America who from the very beginning of their childhood were taught that abortion is women's rights and that if you're a feminist and you care about women, <laughs> then you'll support abortion. Screw unborn women, of course. But if you're a person of human equality, you have to be pro-choice. And these laws were justified under that language. Well, that language and that policy has consequences because it inculcates the American civilization with a certain vision of the good life. And for them, that good life had to entail the ability to deny certain individual human beings their natural right to life so their parents could experience an increased quality of life outside the womb. And those laws will continue, and, and pro-life laws, however, will communicate the truth to the next generation that all human beings are persons and that all human beings are equal in value and dignity. Those laws will communicate the correct version of human flourishing, which is that human rights can only be maintained by great grounding them in our shared human nature, which began at the moment of conception. Those laws will communicate real science, not the anti-scientific bigotry, not the philosophical bigotry that Jen Gunter slapped science onto to justify her position, not the type of science of history that somehow justifies the slaughter of innocent human beings who share our human nature so that you can avoid the responsibilities of parenthood. No, real science, which says that from the moment of conception, we began to exist. And the only difference between the unborn child and us are the same differences between all of us. We differ from one another as born people in the same way the unborn child differs from us because we all find ourselves on a different tick mark on the continuum of human development. But that continuum began at the moment of conception. That is the only way to maintain human equality and equal treatments before the law. And we as a society will be judged by how we treat the least among us. And the least among us in America are those that it is legal to kill. Preborn image bearers created in the image of our prenatal God who entered human history in a womb to redeem mankind from their sins. That is the truth. That is your marching orders, is to contend in the cultural and political sphere so that we teach the right ideas about American exceptionalism and about human equality and human rights, which grants them to all human beings. Well, thanks for joining me today. Head on over to iTunes, YouTube, and Spotify. Give the show a rating and review. Let us know what you think. It really helps. If you want to learn more and engage with me online, head on over to sethgruber.com, S-E-T-H-G-R-U-B as in baby boy, E-R.com to sign up for my newsletter, to see my speaking schedule, if you want to hear me speak live and local, and to learn more. Until next week, I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. <laughs>